Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison. I'm your host for today. Now, if you've been following our previous talks, welcome back. It's brilliant to have you. But if you're new to Nature Live, we're an event that used to happen at the Natural History Museum in our Attenborough studio, where we give you a chance to actually meet and speak with some of our scientific staff to find out a bit about them, but also about some of the brilliant work that they do behind the scenes. Now, our doors are currently closed, not for much longer. So we've decided to bring our Nature Live talks online direct to you at home. Now, for today's talk, we're going to be finding out a little bit more about Darwin, his voyage on the Beagle and some of the fantastic fossils he found along the way. We often associate Darwin with animals uh, like, like beetles, like finches, he was really interested in fossils too. Now to guide us through this story, I'm gonna be joined by Lorna Steele, one of our curators. Now I've got lots and lots of questions for Lorna, but I hope you will have too. So please don't be shy. If you've got any questions at all during our talk, pop them in the comments. We'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can in the time that we have. But let's meet our speaker today, Lorna, are you there? Morning, Alison. All right. Hey, hello, Lorna. It's really good to see you again. Yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we did a previous talk, didn't we? Some of our um, viewers might remember we we had a talk about crocodiles um, a few weeks back, but we're talking about something different today. Um, Lorna, remind us first of all what you do at the museum. I'm a data curator, and I work within. Um, I. <laughs> I used to be the fossil, one of the fossil reptile curators as well. That's why I'm dissecting a crocodile here. Um, yeah, I'm now a data curator. I work completely from home. And my task within the task force team is to sort out databasing stuff that basically I, I can work on remotely. Um, one of the things that I've been doing most recently is a lot of documentation and databasing work relating to Charles Darwin's fossil mammal specimens that he collected during the voyage of the Beagle round South America. Obviously, these specimens have been in the museum for quite some time, and they are in all our old catalogues and they're in our database, but we wanted to create an extra special addition to that database, um, which includes 3D surface scanning of the specimens in order to make digital replicas of them. So why are we focusing on these particular specimens and, and why digitise, why scan them? Well, obviously, anything connected with Charles Darwin has got special significance anyway, just because of who he was and what, uh, what those collecting activities led on to, which obviously was the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859. But all of these fossil mammals that he collected in South America were all new to science at the time, completely unknown species. Um, and it was Richard Owen back in London at the Royal College of Surgeons who was poised to receive these specimens as Darwin was sending them back from South America. And these specimens also launched Richard Owen's career as a paleontologist, which is very interesting too. Richard Owen is better known for coining the term dinosauria, mm. but um, just before then, or around the same time, he was also knee-deep in fossil mammals too. Arguably, it's the mammals that uh, got him on the career ladder as a paleontologist. Brilliant. And, and they're, they're delicate too, aren't they? So it's, is this one of the reasons we're scanning them? Yes. Obviously, we try to avoid handling fossil specimens. In fact, any specimens, if it, if it can be avoided. So if we can make a digital copy of this, that, which will satisfy most people's needs, as in, oh, I need a picture of this, I need to know how big this was, or, you know, all of this sort of information. We can eliminate a lot of object handling, which means that ultimately this is good for the preservation of the specimen. And that's one of the purposes of the museum. It's to preserve the specimens as well as facilitate access to them. So this really is key for these specimens. Yes, all the data is going to be available on this site called Sketchfab. Um, and here we can see the 3D scan of Toxodon platensis. This is brilliant. So it, it means it, basically that anyone around the world could, could access these specimens and, and, and study them closely. Yeah, this is a, the main purpose of the museum. It's to open up access as widely as possible to specimens and to data and to information. That's part of my job. 
Absolutely. Now we're going to find out a little bit more about uh, the, the voyage of the Beagle and, and um, how Darwin found some of these fossils. But let's start with a bit of background about Darwin himself and how he came to be sailing around the world in the first place. Yes, um, he was only 22 when he got this opportunity to join a survey ship captained by Robert Fitzroy. Now, Robert Fitzroy, this was actually the second survey of South America by this ship, by the way. And um, Fitzroy decided this time they needed to have a geologist on board. Now, Darwin had had some geological training just before the voyage. And at the same time, Darwin was also thinking about doing his own voyage of exploration. He was mad keen on natural sciences. He was a big collector of all sorts of insects. He was into all sorts of things, really. So he was itching to, uh, he, the, the travel bug had bitten him, basically, but he hadn't quite got off his backside and made it happen for himself. So when Fitzroy decided he was the kind of person that he'd like to have on board with him, Darwin said, yeah, OK. In fact, Darwin wasn't first choice of people for this voyage. Um, there were a couple of other people that were in the frame beforehand, but both pulled out for various reasons. So Darwin suddenly found himself with this great opportunity, which he grasped with both hands, to give him credit. And he was only 22 when the ship set sail. Yeah, it's amazing to think, isn't it? I mean, when, when I think what I was doing when I was 22, it, it's Ooh. certainly sailing around the world making amazing discoveries. No, blimey. <laughs> Lucky if I got to the end of the street. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the voyage, the Beagle voyage itself, what was it its purpose? You said it was surveying. Yeah, it was doing a hydrographic survey of the coastline of South America. But ultimately, they didn't just content themselves with South America. They set off across the Pacific Ocean as well to survey uh, various islands, coral islands and coral atolls, with the purpose of determining how they had formed because at the time this wasn't fully understood. Um, and you can see the route that they took basically back via New Zealand, Australia, and the Indian Ocean, Mauritius, which was, it's very interesting to read about Mauritius in Darwin's accounts. And he was a great diarist. He was writing down virtually everything he saw, everything they did, and everything that struck him as kind of cool or weird or unusual. Um, eventually coming back to England in uh, 1836, Wow, so that that's 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 a long journey. <laughs> oh yeah, five years away. Five years, five years away. Yeah, that's obviously not solid five years at sea because they were calling in at various ports. But um, mm. it's a long time to be away from home for sure, with very little communication. Mm. What an adventure! Do we know yeah. what the ship itself looked like? The ship itself, I can't believe that you'd go to sea for five years in a ship this small. It's less than thirty meters long, less than eight meters wide. <laughs> Living conditions were cramped. Darwin had to share the captain's cabin. He didn't get much space to himself. He didn't get any space to himself. He got a hammock slung over the chart table towards the stern of the ship. He can't have been very comfortable. Um, no, he was quite keen. Whenever they docked, he was quite keen to get off and uh, go and explore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, those cramped conditions, you've really got to get on with your, your uh, crewmates, haven't you, your, your shipmates? <laughs> they didn't all get on all of the time. He fell out big time with Captain Fitzroy quite early on in the voyage, but they patched it up and um, became lifelong friends. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about um, the, the South American uh, portion of his, his, his journey today, aren't we, and, and the fossils uh, that he found. Uh, so whereabouts did he go um, hunting and, and what did he do with the fossils when he found them? Well, some of them he collected from coastal exposures, so basically cliffs. And there are a couple of very productive sites that they came, that they got to in um, South America, in Argentina. Um, but some of the material he collected while he was off on trips inland, usually on horseback or on foot. Um, everything that he collected, he made arrangements for it to be stored short term and ultimately packed up and sent back to England. And it got it assembled a team of experts back home to look at all the different specimens that he was collecting. So there were there was a guy waiting to receive the plants, someone waiting to receive the insects, someone to receive the mollusks, someone to receive the birds. And as for the fossil mammals, it was Richard Owen and William Clift back at the Royal College of Surgeons in London who were waiting to study and prepare and write publications 
on the specimens that were coming back. So uh, they uh, had a jolly old time of it. It was all new to science. And this is why I say that it really launched the career of Richard Owen, who went on to become the superintendent of the Natural History Museum, as we know today. And what were some of um, Darwin's first finds, the, the first things he came across? Right, well, the first ones were from a site called Punta Alta. And probably the first thing that he collected there within only a very short space of time of arriving is specimens of megatherium. And it was a partial skull. And megatherium is a giant ground sloth. And megatherium was um, already known from other specimens, but Darwin's pieces that he found here really filled in the gaps that were that were missing from other specimens. It's an incredible animal, isn't it? When you, we think of the sloths that we we have today, much much smaller, uh, but 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 you can see some of those features that, that we see in sloths today, like the, the big claws. You can see a complete skeleton on display in the museum, actually. A complete yeah. ethereum. Once we're back open, it's it's well worth going to see. It's an absolutely yeah. incredible, incredible animal. Um, but there were other sloths as well, weren't there? Not just megatherium, there were quite a few. At the same site, he also found the lower jaw of something called Mylodon. Um, in fact, obviously, at the time he found it, he didn't really know what it was and it didn't have a name. But it was named after Darwin by Richard Owen, Mylodon Darwinii. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Actually, quite a lot of what Darwin collected on the Beagle Voyage was subsequently named after him. And rightly so. Yes. <laughs> um, now, he went uh, back to Punta Alta more than once, didn't he? Why was that? Yeah, well, the voyage continued on down the coast. Um, they had other business further down, surveying further stretches of coastline, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America. And they also cut across to the Falkland Islands too, and he did collect fossils there, but not mammals. So they're not part of my project. But they came back up the coast again and came back to Punta Alta, and it was the best part of a year later. And, I mean, well, how did he miss this one on the first trip? Who knows? Um, Skyed Ethereum, almost complete skeleton and articulated and... This is yet another sloth and yet another thing new to science at the time. Wow. And that's, I mean, a huge find in every sense. Rare. Yeah. <laughs> really articulated skeletons as well. Yeah, this was a significance to Darwin because he knew that if it was articulated, then that meant there was originally an entire corpse there and he wouldn't be being misled by perhaps an isolated fossil bone being washed out from older deposits and ending up in younger deposits. That just wouldn't happen with an articulated skeleton. A, an absolutely amazing find. But it, it wasn't just sloths, was it? There were all sorts of, of other animals that, that he came across. Yeah. Now, um, this is interesting. This is obviously a horse. <laughs> Everyone can tell that. Um, but there were no horses in South America, people believed, until the Spanish conquest. And the Spanish brought horses with them and subsequently they went feral and became very widespread. Now Darwin found this fossil horse tooth. It's obviously a horse tooth, but he was confused at the time. He wanted to be sure that it really was fossil and was not a modern horse tooth that had got washed into the deposits. So is it one of these horses that, des that is descended from the Spanish horses? Because if it is genuinely a fossil horse from South America, this is like mind blowing and this is why it's been stated that this tooth is the most important single result of Darwin's collections. And it's just a little horse tooth, you know? Wow. It's amazing. That's, but it proved amazing. that horses were in South America in ancient times and they have become extinct. And the reason why they're now, they're now, they're now there is because the Spanish have reintroduced them from Spain. So there we go. That's Darwin uncovered that that mystery, but it confused him at the time. Absolutely, and I bet it got his mind working, got him thinking and mulling things over, mm -hmm. um, which, which is all important, as we'll find out. <laughs> now, there were some fossils that really stumped Darwin, weren't there? One in particular. They stumped, they stumped Darwin and they stumped Owen when he got them back to London. 
And this is the skull of Toxodon platensis. So Toxodon isn't a sloth. It's a weird thing, sort of in its own right. And when Owen received it, um, he thought it was somehow related. They had a funny concept in those days, really, of um, working out what things were, really. It's, he said it was allied to the rodents, and that's because it had big front teeth, which looked like the big incisors. And remember that in South America, they, there is a giant rodent living today, the capybara. So this, again, mm -hmm. sort of fed into seeing animals today and animals in the past that are very, very similar, you know, in the same areas. So Owen had got this rodent idea going on, but um, how we are, but he also said it's, it's also got affinities with the rhinoceros. Well, you know, rhinoceros, rodents, they're nothing really whatsoever to do with each other at all. So it just goes to highlight the confusion at the time. Great confusion. But now we know that it's basically Toxodon is Toxodon and it's extinct. It's allied to things like the rhinoceros, but very distantly. It belongs to an extinct group of mammals. Yes, sadly, nothing, nothing like it left today. Um, no. <laughs> No, and a, a very strange and, and, and brilliant animal. Um, he did also uh, find more, more sloths, didn't he? There's just one more that you wanted to show us. Um, Glossotherium, yes, yet another ground sloth, yet again another new species collected on this trip. Um, yeah, it just goes on and on and on. He must have been getting fed up of finding sloths. I know, exactly, sloth after sloth, but I mean... <laughs> They're huge. How can, how can you not be impressed by that? <laughs> yeah, it's the back end of a skull. It doesn't look all that impressive, but it's, it is very significant. That's the thing with a lot of Darwin's fossils. You know, if you went and saw them, you'd go, what's the fuss about? But it's, it's the significance to the scientists back at home who were working on them and what this tells us about all sorts of things, life in South America, evolution and extinction. Now, Lorna, you've got a particular favourite of um, his finds, haven't you? Yeah, this is just, oh, fabulous. Macrochenia. Now, this one um, <laughs> made Richard Owen have a bit of an overdramatic reaction when he got it back. Um, he explained <laughs> a gigantic llama in writing, you know, in print. <laughs> it's quite a dramatic reaction. Um, and, and it does look like a gigantic llama, to be fair. It's... He collected um, a huge amount of the skeleton at a site called Puerto San Julian, which at the time was called Port St. Julian in Argentina. Um, and it was where I got the llama idea from is from the neck vertebrae. He thought that the neck vertebrae had features which they shared in common with camels and llamas today. So that was why he threw it in with the llamas. But in fact, it isn't a llama at all. Macrochenia is yet another extinct member of a completely extinct group called the Litopterns. So they're not around anymore. And you're probably wondering about that funny trunk on the face. This is based on evidence on the bone showing muscle scars for the attachment of muscles for a snout, for a proboscis, like an elephant's trunk. It is a real strange um, mishmash of, of different animals, seemingly, isn't it? And I believe only recently we worked out it, it, its relationship to other, other animals. So, um, so we we shouldn't uh, be too judgmental about poor Owen not not knowing what it was. No, he was on the ball most of the time. He was using the evidence before his eyes and the knowledge of the time. So there was nothing wrong with Owen's science. Um, and. Uh, I want to show my particular favourite as well, which is the Glyptodonts. Hooray. Again, um, I think there's one on display in the museum. There certainly uh, used to be. Darwin was finding bits of Glyptodonts virtually everywhere. Um, that carapace that they've got covering their body, that's bone. And so that's quite durable. And also uh, he was finding bits and pieces of them in, in a lot of the other deposits with the other fossils. So yeah, lots and lots of glyptodonts as well. These are amazing. These <laughs> just imagine these lumbering about the. <laughs> oh, some of them are huge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely huge, incredible, heavy beasts. Um, and and we can sort of try to build up a bit of a picture of what that environment back then might have looked like. And, there, and I think we've got an artist's sort of reconstruction that we can show, um, yeah. showing 
some of these animals? That's it. I mean, it, it's an artist's impression. So in real life, it wouldn't have been quite as crowded as that. But the artist is trying to represent all of the animals and a suitable, appropriate environment. So there's sloths there, there's the, the horses, the glyptodonts, and the, the macroquinia there too. And um, mastodon in the background, I think, too. Oh, yes, I hadn't spotted that. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so amazing to get an idea of, of, of the environment back then. Um, yeah. well, we've got some uh, questions, a couple of questions that have come in from our viewers. So I'll just pause briefly to, to a couple of those. Um, Ingrid on Facebook was interested on, in how the, the voyage, the Beagle Voyage was funded. Unfortunately, Fitzroy had to put some of his own money into it. It was a, an officially a, a government voyage. I mean, obviously, it was the Admiralty. Um, there were government interests there. It was about surveying the coastline um, with regard to improving maps of the area to make shipping safer and obviously of course to, to open up natural resources that would be available trading and all that kind of thing um but poor Fitzroy he had to put his hand in his pocket I mean he had plenty of money anyway but he had to shell out to buy I think he bought a new ship halfway through the voyage because <laughs> they needed another one <laughs> probably partly because Darwin was filling it up with fossils <laughs> <but then. Probably. laughs> And apparently Darwin had to subsidise his own passage on board ship. He, he didn't get paid for being on board as, as the on board naturalist either. Mm, I was going to so say. They, they, they basically, the government funded official voyage, but funding was a little bit lacking here and there, and Fitzroy tended to just dip in and buy things without asking permission. He was quite a maverick old Fitzroy. Good for him. I like the yeah. sound of Fitzroy. <laughs> Now, um, we had another question from uh, Jessica, I think this time, on YouTube, um, asking what was the biggest fossil that Darwin found? Do we know? I should think probably that Scalidotherium, while it was all still in one piece, which it isn't anymore because when it got back to London, um, preparation work started on it to isolate all the bones from the rock. So I should think at the time that he found it, probably... Probably that one, all in one piece. Yeah, it was, uh, all, huge, it was all big and heavy. Point. It was all big and heavy. And, and, and in Fitzroy's diary, he notes that uh, in a rather grumbling tone, Darwin keeps bringing all this rubbish on board. <laughs> <laughs> rubbish? Rubbish? <laughs> he, said he, makes, he makes more mess than 10 men. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Lorna, um, amazing, amazing fossil finds. And it's, it's lovely to, to kind of uh, have a look, little whistle -top stop tour through some of the different animals. But what was the, the legacy of the Beagle voyage? How, how did it influence Darwin and others? Yeah, even before the end of the voyage, even while Darwin was still away, he was becoming a celebrity in scientific circles back in London because... Richard Owen was making presentations to the learned societies about the fossils that he was receiving back. And he was giving Darwin full credit for all of this. So the legacy of, of the voyage really was, it, it, it didn't just launch Darwin's career, it made a big impact on Richard Owen's career. He was the author of the first descriptions of all of these fossil mammals. He put them out there in the scientific community and also in the public eye as well. The, the public were very interested in fossils and prehistoric monsters and all this sort of thing as well. Fitzroy also went on to great things. Um, I don't think he did another voyage, but he rose higher through the ranks in the Admiralty. And he went into politics. I think he was an MP for a bit. He was governor of New Zealand for a couple of years. But he was on a bit of a downer as Darwin's work and theory of evolution and everything began to gain ground. And um, he blamed himself for starting it all off. He felt if he hadn't given Darwin the opportunity to come on the voyage, then Darwin's scientific work might not have happened or might not have, have gained the respect that it did. Who knows? We, we, we would have no idea. Wow, because of course his theories were, were, were 
difficult to accept for, for some at the time. They, they? they were easy to accept for a lot of people, but difficult to accept for a lot of other people. You know? and, and there were bits of it that some people accepted and, and didn't accept other bits. It was very strange times. It's really interesting to read more about it. Mm. But what about the impact on Darwin himself? Well, ultimately, the things that he saw and the information that he collected um, in South America and on the rest of the voyage led him to lots of ideas, ultimately, obviously, The Origin of Species, his famous book. But one of the ideas that he had virtually straight away, writing in his diaries during the voyage, was the idea of succession of types. And Owen was on board with this as well, which is the idea that in the fossil record, you see a particular animal, and then this is something very similar lives in the same environment today. So in Darwin's fossils, lots of sloths, obviously, and sloths are in South America now. His glyptodonts, for example, oh, well, okay, there's no glyptodonts today, but there's something really similar, the armadillo, still in South America today. Think about Macroquinia, they thought it was a giant llama, and, you know, there's a, a llama relative today in South America, in fact, there are quite a lot, um, the vicuña and the Juanaco, and Darwin saw all of those alive and kicking on his inland trips. So the succession of types, this was an idea that perhaps kind of started him thinking in a way towards evolution. It's not evolution itself, but it's a stepping stone along the way. It shows how he was thinking, and he was thinking a lot. Absolutely. Um, and you actually answered a, a couple of questions, actually, uh, that we got in from uh, YouTube and Facebook about the, the glyptodon itself. Uh, uh, someone was asking, are they related to the armadillo? Uh, someone else was asking, are they like a tortoise? But it's that affinity with the armadillo, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure if they're closely related, but they certainly got the same sort of ecological niche, if you like. So I think that's what Darwin was edging towards with his succession of types. Um, for instance, if an animal becomes extinct from, from one area, you reintroduce, you, it's beneficial sometimes to reintroduce something to that area to take its place, if mm -hmm. you like. I mean, this is another subject area, but we could talk about the possibilities of introduction of the wolf to Scotland. We've reintroduced um, beavers to certain English rivers, you know, all this mm. sort of thing. Um, filling a niche with the kind of animal or plant that's kind of supposed to be there, you know, part of the ecosystem. Without it, everything else collapses or changes in a weird way. Um, and of course, in addition to uh, succession of types, Darwin's also very interested in in observing the geology and the nature of change in the environment over time as well, which which all kind of starts to feed into um, eventually perhaps his, his bigger theories. Before the voyage, Darwin was primarily a geologist. That was really what he was training to do to some extent before the voyage. And it's also the reason why he was hired. So he had to really swat up on geology. One of his friends took him on a crash course in geological fieldwork just before the voyage. And Darwin also took with him on the voyage a very important book at the time by Charles Lyell, which is The Principles of Geology. So while he was on the voyage, he was doing a lot of reading and formulating his ideas. Darwin really paid close attention to the rocks where his fossils were. So he wasn't just hacking them out and paying, taking no notice. He was actually paying attention to the nature of the deposits. Is it sandstone? Is it mud? Where have these pebbles come from? And so on and so on. And he, he drew geological maps and he drew stratigraphic logs of where his fossils were from. Didn't just ignore the rocks in the quest for fossils, which a lot of collectors later on did. Mm. Just, so, after, just after the bones, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how important do we think the fossils were to, to his eventual thinking, to his, his coming up with his, his theories? Well, they were part of it because, as I've already said, um, Darwin was taking in a lot on this voyage. And he was looking at plants, he was looking at the fossils, he was looking at the animals. Um, his, his mind was absolutely everywhere. He just took it all in. Um, it's a bit of a mystery why it took him so long to work up to publishing The Origin of Species after the voyage. But that's because he was working on other things as well. He was publishing on other things and he was sort of still gathering data and letting it all congeal in his mind and, and turn over. So um, 
he he was a slow worker, but he got he got the book out in the end. <laughs> Big ideas take time. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I think he was rather prompted by the emergence of another naturalist into the scene who was having similar ideas to Darwin, but he was working in another part of the world. He was working in the um, Southeast Asia. His name is Alfred Wallace, and he's honoured by a very fine statue in the garden of the Natural History Museum. And Alfred Wallace was coming up with virtually the same ideas as Darwin, where they were different ideas. They were actually complementing each other, and they corresponded and then eventually co-published a paper that was presented in 1858. So Darwin was pretty much good to go with his book, but the actual uh, conference presentation, I suppose is what we'd call it today, was joint between Wallace and Darwin in 1858. But Wallace hadn't contributed materially to the book, so that's why that's only got Darwin's name on it. Um, were really important to, to acknowledge is Wallace's they were, Well, they were working independently, but coming to exactly the same conclusions, really. Um, we've had a couple more questions from our viewers online. Uh, we've had a question uh, from Adam, or Adam King on YouTube, asking, were Darwin and Richard Owen good friends? <laughs> That's an interesting question. That sort of thing is quite hard to work out because we only have, if you like, written records, you know, letters that w w were written between them. And people often will behave differently in person than they do on paper. However, having said that, I think, to be honest, Richard Owen was a guy who was quite difficult to get on with by all accounts. He fell out with a lot of other people in scientific circles. He was accused of plagiarism. And I have myself seen examples where he's taken advantage of something that someone else has found and sent to him a fossil specimen. Um, he's not given them any acknowledgement and then basically steamed off on his own, you know, without so much as a thank you very much. So um, I think he, he was a very, very driven guy. Darwin was the opposite. He was a bit more of a nice guy. He helped other people out. He sort of didn't expect much help himself. Um, and they, they did ultimately fall out. However, at the time of the voyage, things were fine. Owen was no doubt quite happy to be receiving all the fame in London, receiving all this stuff. There's someone out there doing all the hard work, sending all these specimens back to him. He's writing them up and getting all the glory. He's giving Darwin plenty of credit, to be fair. He's bigging him up. Mm. But the relationship did decline. Mm. Um, and we had a, a question from Natalie on Facebook. Um, she was wondering um, if we know anything about Darwin's thoughts on uh, unique Australian animals like platypus and koala. I think Richard Owen was working on those quite early on as well. Um, they didn't really stop for long in Australia. Uh, the ship was on its way back by that point. I know they called it, uh, and, and they also kind of went the wrong way around. They went, um, oh my God, battery power low. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> this is live. <laughs> 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 probably all right. <laughs> um, they they went south of they went Hobart in Tasmania. They went south around Tasmania and came back up around. I don't know what he thought about um, fossils from um, from Australia, but there were plenty known at the time. And of course, it's got its own unique form. He was well aware of it all. Um, mm. What he thought of it, I'm not too sure, but it would be, be quite easy to find out. Of course, Darwin's voyage didn't, um, you know, he didn't really touch on it too much in his diaries. I think the second half of the voyage, he was quite keen to get home. You do, you do see a, a bit of a deterioration in record keeping. <laughs> I think he was getting kind of fed up. Exactly. You can't really blame him after five years. <laughs> we had a, a question from uh, YouTube asking if Dar did Darwin know about? Oh, I think we might have lost Lorna. 
Oh, what a shame! I think we've we've sadly lost uh, Lorna. I think I think we lost her battery. Um, but I wanted to, to thank her so much for her fantastic talk today. Apologies, we didn't quite get to the end. But if you are interested in seeing those uh, Darwin's fossils, um, go to our Sketch Fab website. It's absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend it. You can access. Uh, these amazing fossils, you can do all sorts of things. You can scroll around them, you can zoom in, you can examine them in all kinds of ways. So it's really well worth a look. This website isn't just for scientists, it's for everybody to access. So do go and have a look if you can. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, the, the Voyage of the Beagle and Darwin's fossils, we have an absolutely fantastic book written by one of our scientists, Adrian Lister. I know uh, Lorna was really keen to, to plug Adrian's book. It's absolutely brilliant, but it, it tells the story of the journey and of the, the fantastic fossil finds along the way as well. Uh, so do have a look at that. Thank you so much for joining us today and for, for all of your fantastic questions. We will be back again next week. We are, of course, back on Tuesdays at 12. Uh, we've got a fantastic talk on uh, cetacean specimens and what we can find out from their earwax. And then on Friday, we've got an extra special Nature Live. We actually got a very family friendly quiz. So do join us again next week. But for now, we'll say goodbye and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you.